Welcome back, everyone. We enjoyed talking with many of you at the open forum earlier. We were able to answer most of the questions, but oh, Aceware was stumped on one question. So congratulations to that lucky person who I'll leave unnamed. I want to share what our giveaway is for this session. We've got some pecan sensations from Savannah Sweets coming going home to one of you lucky folks that are in our audience today. And without anything further, I would like to introduce Sarah. Sarah, can you bring your webcam up so we can say hello? Are you there, Sarah? There she yeah. is. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It's good to see you. Sarah has been with Lewis Clark State College for most of the most of the last 24 years, and she serves as the keeper of the flame for their Aceware unit. Um, she is an Aceware champion educator. We've had a couple of other Aceware champion educators with us this week. Sarah is working on her bachelor's in business administration and hopes to finish this year. And if school and work are not enough, she's also a great photographer, and she enjoys fishing and snow skiing. She is the liaison between their workforce training center and main campus, and she works to make sure all policies and procedures are followed and that all the audit procedures are met. And she works each year to further refine those processes. And these audit processes are what she's here to share with us today. Sarah, we do appreciate you being with us. I'm going to turn over some of the controls to you. And so you can bring up your presentation. And everybody, as usual, please uh, type your questions in the chat box so we can get those to Sarah and get those answered. Sarah, without any more, I'm going to go off webcam and turn things over to you. We are seeing your screen now. And we're Perfect. seeing you as well. If you want to stay Great. on that sign, if you want to drop your webcam, you can do that too, whatever is best for you. Thanks much. All right. So I'm going to be asking a few questions as I go along. But um, if anybody has any questions, please just put those out there. And Sharon can share those with me so that I can ask answer questions as we go. Um, so about three years ago, we came to some issues with, um, we had no way to really reconcile uh, precisely with the campus using colleague. Um, and in order for us to be able to justify that we were gonna stay on Aceware and use Aceware solely for both our student management and for our cash box reconciliation, was able to um, build a relationship with uh, the controller's office, the, the cash management people on campus um, to design a very uh, strict audit process. Um, so we developed that and implemented it. And as Sharon said, we've revamped it multiple times in the last two years. But uh, after I gave my presentation last year in Las Vegas, uh, I was able to sit down with Lindsay and um, and Chuck, we we kind of revamped some things. So if you were at my presentation in Vegas last year, it's going to look quite a bit different. Um, I'm still going to touch on how we used to do it and how we do it now, just for people that um, may not be able to do it the new way. So before we started, um, we had to sit down and really problem solve and build a collaborative team between cash management and uh, the workforce training team to uh, make sure that my needs were being met, um, obviously what we could do in Aceware and then what um, campus needed us to do to be able to meet their needs to, to prove that we had a very strict audit process that any cash that we were bringing into our office and bringing into Aceware was also going into the colleague system. Um, how many of you out there are in a similar situation with your um, financial management for like your main campus? I'll just kind of leave okay, that out. Okay, so, yep, 
if I'm there raising hands, we're going to see who's in kind of a same situation with trying to get reporting process of boy. I'm seeing just one that is right that are raising their hands right now. Okay. <clears throat> so there were two different before we had to add a UDF, so a user identified field, and I'll cover that. But we were able to last year with working with Lindsay and Chuck um, find out that we were able to use a current field that was in there. So what you really need to do before you start is just see what fields you're using that you could match up with what the colleague system or whatever financial system your college is using and then the report fields and then how frequently you're going to have to reconcile. So during heavy registration times, I may say in a deposit in daily or um, obviously it's been slower since COVID happened. So right now I'm sending a deposit in just weekly, but I reconcile with the controller's office once a month. So those are just some things to think about before you get started. So going through that problem solving process, the problem was um, there was no way to tie the deposit or reference number from the college back to our system. So that was what our particular problem was. So we were able to build our team relationship by making their job easier, but it also made my job tremendously easier. We were spending hours every week reconciling between um, the information we were having to send to the cashier um, and then put their deposit numbers back into our system. And then obviously it was making a, a much larger job for the auditor too, to make sure everything was reconciling. So as I said, we were able to, um, when we first put this process in place, we were able to implement a UDF um, on the student record where I could put that colleague number in. So the first thing that um, when you start this process, I would uh, meet with your technician. So in our case, it was Lindsay and find out what fields we were using currently or if we needed to build a new field, which in our case, we just built another field right on our payment screen where when I received the colleague receipt number back from the cashier's office, I was just able to go onto that screen. And I'll show you guys some screenshots as we go through. So on your UDF, your user identified field, um, that was how LC State previously reconciled. Um, are you currently using the deposit number field in Cashbox? And so that's what I'm gonna go over today mostly is that we're using the deposit number field um, in the cash box screen. And uh, what information can you easily reference? So what can you put in from main campus into the ACEWARE system that will give you a very easy, quick reference number? And ours ended up being just a colleague receipt number where we used to have a different receipt number for every single transaction that we had to put in. Now we're able to put one colleague receipt number for an entire day or sometimes even an entire week's worth of transaction. So that's greatly reduced our audit process. And then what information will the auditors be looking for? Um, so obviously, you know, like if they just need to see that, you know, um, Sharon Brookshire took a class, she paid $50 in cash and put the rest on her credit card. We needed to be able to prove that that $50 and the credit card went to main campus and were deposited through their system and that um, ACEWARE was going to reference that number too. And then obviously, how, easy, how can you easily reference the information in Student Manager? Oops. So on the report fields, we needed to know what fields for the long term and the short term reports we would need. Um, so we went back and forth on that. Um, we just basically needed the college system reference number, which again is the colleague receipt number for us. Um, and like I said, we used to have a different number for every single transaction. And now we have um, maybe one receipt number for a week's worth of OPC, which we use official payments for our credit card processing. And then we may have a separate receipt number for if cash came in that day. but 
um, it's really simplified down to maybe one reference number for that week. So as long as it totaled $3,100 for that week's worth of transactions, that was good enough for our auditor. Um, and then we needed the payer. So whether it's a firm, a student, or parent, um, it will list the actual payer name on that audit field. And then the payment type, so if it was check, cash, or OPC, which the great thing about um, the cash box report is it you can filter by any of those fields. So if I just want, <clears throat> excuse me, check transactions, I can filter those out just by check, just by cash, just by OPC, or I can run a report with all three of them. And then the payment date, the student, and the course. So those are things that we had to consider when we were building our reports is what we would need for long term, like if an auditor was to come back and look at our last year's transactions versus what I need to send to the cashier for, you know, just that day or just that week, I was able to make the same report for both of those needs. Are there any questions on that part? You're doing fine. Continue on. Um, the last part of the things that I told you guys to think about before would be the reconcile the reconciliation um, frequency, and that's another huge benefit of using the cash box. Um, like I said, I can do um, the transactions by day. Um, I'm able to sort by payment type, by account number, and when I say account number, that means um, I have separate accounts set up for each of my departments, so like all of my medical classes, all of my apprenticeship classes, I'm able to sort those transactions by that field as well. So that tells me like um, how much money came in for just Allied Health that day that I need to put into just the Allied Health um, account. And then also transactions for certain dates. So if I came in on a Monday and I need to run my report from Thursday to deposit that money, I'm able to just set those dates in cash box. So I'm not like running a daily cash box and then having to add all those together. I can set, you know, that I want to run from last Thursday till today. And it gives me those numbers just with a click of a button. And then also it will give me the report total transactions each month. So that's how we were able to file our audit away is once all the transactions for the month were verified, it's complete, it's done. So what we found is, will this work in the long run? And the answer was very much a yes. And so then what? We had to prove that the there was data integrity, which became very easily to do once we had the system down. So when I talk about the cash box deposit number field, um, you guys will see in the red circle um, how many people are currently using that field for anything on the cash box. Okay, uh, folks, raise your hand if you're using in, uh, what the deposit number field is what we're talking using deposits for payments uh, is a question, Nicole. Yeah, that was a field that we weren't using in our previous process. Okay. So uh, I have uh, looks like only one other person is using that. So you might explain again, uh, emphasize how that you think that benefits you on that. So go for it. Great. So um, last year when we revamped our deposit process and our um, audit process, we were able to start using this field. So this is the field that some people were using. Um, you know, they might assign a deposit number. Um, so if it's 2019 or, or 2020, um, and this is the 302nd deposit you've done, maybe you have like a, a numbering system um, that you've assigned to that batch of a deposit. We weren't using that field, and so we were able to go in, and this is now the field that we use. Um, when we get the deposit back from the cashier's office, that's where I actually put the colleague number. So if people aren't already using that field, it is definitely the best um, way to, to apply that deposit number. And by doing that, um, I'm kind of ahead of myself, but we're able to just type that in I'm able to select, so you'll see on this particular one, it would be for all Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American, American Express, I can't talk today, um, transactions for April 16th. So you would just 
check what payment types you're covering and then I assign that number and then you go down to instead of I usually go to print preview to make sure that my deposit number matches but once you hit that print report it will automatically assign that deposit number to all of the transactions in there so it's it's very high integrity because it's going to stamp the same number on all of the deposit um, it met all of our needs so thank you Chuck and Lindsay you saved my office hours and hours and hours of work each week so for the one person that is not able to use that so you said you had one person raise their hand um, this was our former process so we recreated a UDF on our um, payment processing screen and you'll see it there at the bottom so that's where I would put the colleague receipt number. So for that particular transaction and then the date that it was posted in the colleague system. And so that's what we were using previously to, um, to reconcile those two uh, receipt numbers. If you need a UDF, um, your technician can help you set that up so that it will appear there. Um, it was much more time consuming, but you know, at that point we didn't know any different. So it was just <laughs> what it was. Um, this process is slower. Um, there's more chance of error or for, um, but there's still, you know, it's the data integrity is gonna be very high because you're double checking the number. Um, you just have to enter it manually for every single transaction. But Chuck also has a magic box code if you have multiple transactions with the same reference number. Um, and so before we figured out that we could be using this previous um, screen that I showed you where it says deposit number, uh, we were working with Chuck to write that um, code for the magic box, so. Has anybody been using the system since um, I did my previous presentation in Vegas. Raise your hands. We have a few hands going up here, Sarah, uh, uh, Tracy, and just, just a few, Sarah. Just a couple. So again, if you've been using this process, obviously it's working, but um, if you need help like going back or starting this new process, I have to say it's just literally cut hours out of our processing. So. Um, if it is an option for you, you know, obviously I'd be happy to to share more in depth. Um, it's hard to kind of include every single thing into a half an hour presentation, but um, obviously I'm here as a resource to help however I can. Okay, so for those of you that are not even familiar with where the cash box report is or how to get to it, um, if you go into reports and accounting, it's your very top selection cash box. If that is grayed out, and this is part of your job is to reconcile your accounts, um, make sure that you're getting access to that cash box. Um, Lindsay or Chuck could give you more information on what your settings have to be to be able to get to the screen, but I know not all of my staff have access to this. So first things first is you would have to have access to that cash box and it will save you hours. So it's definitely worth having access to. So this is just another overview of what report fields I ended up getting. And so um, I kind of went over the screen before, but I just wanted to go over it again so you guys could see what our report ended up looking like. So we have the colleague re reference number, and this could be different, you know, by, um, each college obviously, but if you also want me to export this report and send it to you, I'm not gonna volunteer, but I know that Lindsay can walk me through it for some reason. I always <laughs> on, on well, if you want that, report. yeah, we, Sarah, we can tell them if they're interested in that, just send us a note and we'll we'll connect, we'll get All that right. report to And I saw that you have this up so people can obviously steal this sometimes it's easier for me to see you know exactly what fields are and where so um this is what the final report looks like so you'll see when i first send this um, report the first column for deposit number is obviously blank because this is what i'm sending to the college about it lists all the transactions so for this particular time period 
for May 15th through May 21st, I would be depositing $830. And so again, I'm gonna go back. These are the fields that we listed. This is how we designed the report. And then this is what the actual report looks like. So this met my needs for like my daily transactions and then also meets my needs for, you know, my monthly reconciliation or if we were to have an auditor come to campus, we are able to just instantly print this out and it gives them all of the information they need. So it is amazing. Any questions on that part? I'm not seeing questions, but we have several people interested in the report that um, we'll get that to them with Lindsay's help. Thanks. Great, great. And obviously like the account number and that's again, like, so this 613 tells the, the cashier's office to deposit that to my apprentice, you know, so obviously it's very easy to modify that to what particular fields you need or that your cashier needs. So on the daily transactions, again, you can do by payments received. So I usually do a separate deposit for all of my credit card transactions and then a different deposit for my checks and cash because I can do my credit card transactions electronically. Like I just email the report to them where obviously my checks and cash have to manually go up to our campus, which um, we're a couple miles off campus. So um, the report ran from student manager for the day. Um, it always closes through. Um, the midnight before the day, so that wasn't really clear, but um, like our OPC would close midnight last night. So if I was going to run my deposit, it I would just go in and tell it, you know, through yesterday's date. And then I send the, re the um, report to the college cashier and they can report back any discrepancies on their end. So if I'm reporting something in student manager, an OPC payment, but it's not showing up on their end, then we um, instantly know that there's an issue between the systems, which I think has only happened once in maybe the last three years, but it has helped on that too. It's just a, a very good check and balance between our two departments um, to be able to, this is what I show, this is what you show, and move forward. So. so this is what my daily report would look like. So like I said, right now it's low, um, enrollment, but there are days where I have to do, you know, I might have a page of transactions just for that day if it's a high enrollment period. And then this is an example of the worksheet, um, the spreadsheet that we put those in. So you'll see our old way. We had to list um, every single transaction and now I'm able to um, go in and report those accounts. So all of everything that was going into 613 would now um, be bundled together. So any of you that are using that spreadsheet now, um, after my presentation in Vegas, if you want me to go through how we've also simplified that, I'm happy to do that. But all three of these transactions before would have had a separate um, deposit number from the cashier. And when I came back from Vegas last year, I was able to sit down with them again and we were able to um, simplify this even further. So this deposit for all three of those transactions would have the same receipt number. So that's another way we were able to um, simplify it. So if you're able to talk to your cashier, if right now you're processing hundreds of different, you know, deposit numbers for every single transaction and you can simplify those down to like one transaction number for the day, that will definitely help your processing too. Did everybody follow that? <laughs> Just stop me and stop there if anybody's asking questions. But Nope, I haven't seen any questions come up, but as you think of them, folks, send them our way. Um, the monthly reconciliation. Um, I track all the transactions. I'm able to sort by the payment type. So again, I'm able to do, you know, if I just need all of the cash transactions for the month, I'm able to just do that in a single click by just selecting cash and then putting, you know, June 1st through June 30th, I'm able to do that. Um, I'm able to send those with the deposit. Um, the college returns the colleague receipt. I'm able to do a check and balance. And then we've been filing for three years. Um, now that we've had the audit process um, in place, um, 
it's been about three years actually since we originally have done this audit process with the OPC number. Um, I know Gloria was in my position before I started a little bit over five years ago, maybe six now, um, and it was being done. But we've just now, because of the new audit process, we've actually got permission to not have to keep those records, paper records for the three years. So right now I'm just keeping back a year just so I have them for my own use. But we've been able to get approved that we no longer have to have like the paper copies for three years, which as you guys know, sometimes those paper copies take up more space than any of us have room for, so. Um, when matching the systems, we were able to come up with a good check and balance system. So um, again, just by doing that print screen on the cash box, I'm able to make sure that my deposit is matching what the college has posted into our accounts just by a click of a button. Um, I'm able to enter the receipt from the college directly into student manager, and I'm able to look for um, data integ integrity issues throughout the month. So if something is a little out of whack, which like last month I had my deposit for my allied health classes went into the wrong account, I was able to do that with just a very simple check and balance and have the cashier check that. So that's some um, other ways that having this new audit process has helped my, me matching my systems um, just to make sure the money is actually going where it's supposed to because we all know those clerical errors can happen very easily. So again, this is how you get to the cash box report. So when I get the receipt number back from the, from the college, I just go up to accounting to the cash box and then I'm gonna select which transactions I'm gonna reconcile. So on this particular one, I'm gonna reconcile my Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. So I make sure that those are the only boxes that are um, checked. Um, if I was gonna do my cash and check, I usually do those together separately. And then obviously my refunds I do separately. So I basically run these reports for three different selections. Um, my cash and check separately, my Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express separately, which is um, what we use official payments for. And then I also do one separately for refunds. Um, but at the end of the month, I'm able to have them all compiled together. So it works out really nice. So for this one, I did Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express. That deposit, again, is the number that comes back from um, the college cashier. So that is the number that they see in colleague when they look up that deposit. And then I enter my range of payment dates, which is 4-16-2020 to 4-16-2020 in this instance. And the also the another benefit of this is um, here you can, um, you can output this as a PDF, which I do very frequently, um, especially when I'm doing my end of month audit. Um, I'm able to keep those on file. So that's another great um, part of this new audit process is I'm able to just output as a PDF, save it as, you know, in this case, it would be April audit and it's saved um, to our server. And then I have um, my verification done. Or if I need to email that to somebody, I'm able to easily do that. Are there any questions on that screen? There is a question from Metropolitan Community College that we'll throw out and see if maybe between you and Lindsay and to see if there's more information that's needed. But they're asking about a way to add general ledger numbers in for taxes and things if they have to itemize their reconciliation. Any advice or thoughts or maybe we want to think on it here and let her continue? And um. The only thing I would suggest is on this um, audit reconciliation, you see where it says account number. If the taxes or whatever the fees are, are going into a different account number, then you should be able to sort it out there. So it would say, you know, $90 went into 613 and then, you know, possibly like the $5 went into 612 if that was my tax account. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here. And again, I think the the concern is, or the if the issue is 
for a single registration fee for one class. Uh, there is typically one account number assigned to the course and then that payment to that course is referenced to that course account number. If, uh, the, if the desire is that you want that $90 tuition to be split four ways, you know, $70 tuition, $10 supplies, $10 books, and whatever they come up to, two cents for uh, a donation to Alma's um, uh, retirement fund. We don't have a way to do that at this time, um, other than some serious custom programming on the report. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to, again, kind of cover you on that, uh, um, Sarah, because I'm pretty sure that's something that is not available. Uh, now, now the carry, a caveat on that, I suppose if you were to have optional fees on the course that might be mandatory optional fees, this is getting into a little bit more advanced, where a different optional fee description was account X and you know supplies was in one account and books was always in another account, the cash box report could be modified with some serious tweaking to be able to separate those funds out into um, you know different sub accounts. Uh, but yeah, that would take a little bit of setup, and uh, if, if that's a serious need of anybody, you'd need to get with your tech, and uh, we begin to work with you on that. So, um, Sarah, uh, unless you thought of something, you haven't had to deal with I that. It, it, no, yeah, it ahead. actually makes complete sense because that account number is set up at the course level. So, yeah, that that would be exactly right, Chuck. We set so I. When I set up my apprenticeship classes, you know, I assign them to account 613, um, you know, Allied Health 628. So, um, yeah, without doing a fee report. Luckily, I don't have to do that. The cashier takes care of any tax at their oh, end. Yeah. We have very, very little unless, you know, somebody was on a scholarship. And so we build their payer um, the cost of their book. So. LC is lucky to not have to break down the GL on that level. Obviously, all all of my apprentice classes um, are going to go to the same ledger. They're all going to go to six one three. Sounds good. One, one thing, I think just to yeah, just to jump in very quickly, it, it's it would be the same idea as having multiple fees, you know, additional fees and things on the course. But the your your other option could potentially be, uh, and <laughs> you'd have to make a, an individual payment for each amount, but with that you could, correct me if I'm wrong, you can select account numbers on the payment record. So right. now you for might be making four account right. or four payments, but you would right. have it tied. So that's a, a, another option. Right, now again, the, this, the, the limitation on that would be web payments because the web, on the oh, web, yeah. we expect one solid payment. As Lindsay's saying, from student manager, if you're if you're entering data through the student manager interface, you can uh, again apply, uh, put in as many individual payments, and each payment record can actually be tied to an account number. So, yeah, excellent point on that, Lindsay. Uh, the challenge yeah, would be web. Yeah. web registration. Uh, there there wouldn't be a way to uh, to be able to split that up without some yeah. fairly heavy custom programming. Um, all right, uh, good question though. And, and again, uh, if that's something we'd invite you to, uh, you know, MCC to get back to us on if that's something you want to pursue. Sarah, I think we, Sharon, we'll turn it back over to Sarah. Just my last comment on that. Um, if you'll see under the deposit number, it says only report numbers for this account number. So if you are able to break your GL or your class out, and I want to um, see just the transactions I did for apprenticeship. I'm able to select that with this drop down here, if everybody can see my pointer. Um, if you click on that, it, it will bring down like 613, 628. Um, I have about 10 different account numbers that I deposit into. So that probably obviously isn't going to help on the fee level, but if you do need to do like a separate deposit, you know, just for um, your kids college or just for your senior classes um, then you're able to do that by um, account number
So this is what it looks like um, before this field is filled in. So this deposit number here, you'll see that green box. That's where it's going to feed that number. When I go to the bottom of that and hit um, print preview, this is what it's going to look like. And then when I hit print report here, it's going to autofill this number here. So it gives you a chance to actually triple check your your number, you know, is it really 392087 um, before it stamps every one of those transactions? Because if you do stamp all of those transactions with the wrong number, you have to go in and change them manually, which is no fun for anybody. So this is what it looks like after I put that number in. So when I do my monthly reconciliation, um, I'm able to double check all the transactions. I confirm the accuracy with the cashier and the controller's receipts. And then I file a hard copy with the student manager reports or receipts for um, the daily transactions and the college receipts. And like I said, we used to have to keep all of that for um, three years and now I'm doing it um, just for the last year, just mostly for my own personal records. Um, we're no longer required to do that under our, our campus audit. So. Um, on the monthly reconciliation, I go in and double check that all the transactions have been entered. So I go back to this payment screen or this cash box screen and I put the number or I select check, cash check, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express, refund. And then I do it for the entire month. You just leave that deposit number field blank, obviously. Um, so on this case, I would do it for the entire month of April. And it will give me all of the transactions. And so I just make sure that all of them have the receipt number um, from the cashier, um, that there's been any interdepartment payments, that those have all been um, recorded. And then at to go, sometimes our check and credit memos come in a little bit differently. And I know um, last year we talked about that too. So I know that some of the other institutions have the same issues and then scholarships. So, Mostly anything, any payments that may have come in through a different department or different means than, you know, cash or check or that sort of thing. So I usually try to do that by the 10th of each month. And then we have a representative from the controller's office that has access to student manager to the cash box. Um, and they log in to the student manager and then run the report. And by them doing it personally, not just getting the report from me, they're able to verify those numbers on their end which was also another um, point that our auditors needed us to be able to do, is that they have access to actually check it themselves. You know, they, they're not just gonna take our word for it that everything reconciled. So the controller's office goes in and they double check for all of the colleague transactions and then they report back to us any discrepancies. So perhaps there was like a interdepartment payment, you know, from um, the business division took a CPR class from us and maybe I didn't have that payment recorded that it had already hit through our account. So those sorts of things. So an important note for those of you that are still using the UDF method or um, that would need to, when you, if you use the UDF method, I just wanted to put this note out there that um, when you're making the corrections to make sure that your date is reflective of the month that it needs to show up on the audit report, um, so if you were going to go back and make a correction on April, um, maybe you missed putting a receipt number in, you would want to make sure that that add date is not dated today. You would want to make sure that it um, is dated April or in this case, September, so that it shows up on the September report. This is the field that will feed back into um, the audit report. So that's only pertinent if it's um, somebody using this UDF field. So once your reconciliation is complete, um, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, um, the whole point of this was to make your job easier, make their job easier, and to make the auditor's job unnecessary. And, and like I said, we've pretty much got it to that point. You know, the auditors know that we're doing what we need to do. The, um, cashier is able to make all of the transactions on one 
deposit now rather than entering every single transaction from us individually. And obviously we're able to cut hours out of our process too. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, if you have questions, everyone bring those up, but a couple lessons learned here, you know, they, Sarah, applause, applause for building those bridges with the cashier's office. That is awesome. And folks, as you hear, if you have pain points or things you'd like to streamline or thoughts or ideas or can it, you need to, to let us know because that's what we like to help solve problems. You heard a little bit of that today where Chuck and Lindsay were already brainstorming some some ideas here. But we can't do that, I guess, if we don't know that you're struggling with something. So, Chuck, other comments while I see if there's questions well, that come in? Well, um, uh, let, uh, let me ask Sarah, are you able to jump to either a demo or to a live system right now? I was going to suggest if you haven't, uh, that you relate it. Whenever we get into finance, I always want to make sure people know about the F7 payment lookup. Um, and and while, while you're getting ready, uh, Sarah, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody a question. How many of you have run the F7? It's the green screen in the last month. The F7 key in Student Manager, which is a payment finder, or the AW pending, which we're going to talk about in a bit. All right, we got a couple. Three, four, five. Okay, so we only have about five out of the 30 here, or 40, that are using that, Sarah. Are you able to... Uh, Chuck, not, I would have to go. I would have to go out. I don't have the demo. Oh, on. You, that's okay. That's okay. I'm well, turning I things happen, over to you. I happen to have the demo up, so uh, let me just sh give you a quick uh, shout out on that, if I can get logged in. <clears throat> and when I'm talking about F7 key, let me close up a couple things. Uh, it's part of the uh, keyboard shortcuts group. <clears throat> and again, F2 enrollment, instructor, registration, that brand new one, person locator, and the F7 pay grabber. Well, so what that allows you to do, F7 allows you to find, if you would, a needle in the haystack on a given payment. <clears throat> so again, if you are doing reconciliation with all pending, which again, come back at th three o'clock with Jason, he'll tell you all about it. Uh, but uh, this is can be used for that. But it can also be used to dig out a payment out of the woodwork. And you say, well, someone says, I have a receipt number, blah, blah, but I don't know what course it was. Well, if you knew the receipt number, you could type it in and pull up um, that 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 in that receipt, the payment, and the registration in the class that it went to. Now, a web transaction. If you're trying to reconcile a web transaction, you can do that. Uh, so again, let's do on my dummy data. I want to find out what payments have I received in the last year between fifty and one hundred dollars. So we're going to put in the add date 0101. We're going to say clear back to 19 up to the present time, shift F2. And it'll pull up every payment uh, in the database uh, between 99 uh, or between 50 and $100. It shows you the student, the course, um, detail about the payment. And if you say, well, I want to know exact details, you can double click on the record and go to edit registration, go into the payment and drill down to the details. So again, if you are is responsible for tracking down, chasing payment information, um, the F7 key is a great little tool for that. And um, Again, it does allow you to export to Excel. I know a lot of you like that. So, all right, well, Sharon, we got another question. So go ahead. We'll let Sharon we'll let get on. Sharon. <laughs> um, this is, I'm not seeing a question, just a statement. It looks like oh, something Tracy, we might need oh, to. Tracy, yeah, Tracy we might need to respond. Asking, Amex come in as Visa, it's Amex. Okay, there's a, um, yeah, we'll get with, um, We'll get we'll with get. our client on that. So um, 
One of the things that I would reference again on payments is that in the edit preferences, we'll see if we can get another question for Sarah here. Uh, one of the options you've got under payments is to define alternate payment types. And Tracy's having some issues with her Amex payment. Um, but um, the point is, if you are needing to track payments, and I think um, mid-planes might be looking at, this is more like the source of the check rather than what the payment is for. But if you needed to distinguish between uh, payments that are coming from a scholarship fund or payments that are coming from a workforce grant, you can actually define a payment type as a particular source and then in cash box, you can actually separate that payment type out. Are you doing any custom payments, Sarah, on any of your programs for your setup? Payment type? Sorry, I had my microphone yeah, muted. Okay. Is it? But yes, we do. So okay. I'm able to do like um, interdepartmental charge. I have scholarship. Um, I have Edgego right off just because sometimes Edgego takes the money and sometimes we do directly. And that was <laughs> their way to reconcile um, scholarships. I think I already said that. But yeah, so we have quite a few. And the great thing about Cashbox is it will list whatever you have in those fields. It will list it directly on that Cashbox screen. Sounds good. Um, anybody else? Sharon, um, anything else you can think of that we need to cover? I think, Sarah, you've done a, a good job. And again, I th Sarah's pretty, uh, is, is great help that if you uh, are exploring that and, and before you talk to or even after you've talked to your ACEWAR tech, you wanted to kind of uh, dig down some details, uh, we're happy to share Sarah's contact info, and uh, she's a she's a great helper, and would be happy to give you some time and and help you think through your situation. So Sharon, Sharon, we'll see you. Well, to you took level. the took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say Sarah is a very good resource and um, is somebody who who loves to help others. So you certainly have another contact here. Thank you very much, Sarah. We appreciate that you spent some time with us. And those of you that requested that report, we'll get to work on that. And Lindsay, I'll be in touch with you on that. Um, I need to give a shout out to the University of Southern California. Jamie, um, you are the winner of this pecan, these delightful pecans. And so you'll hear from Sarah so we can get those to your home office if we need to. And we're going to give you a short break. And then you can join us again where Jason will share about AW pinnings, everything you want to know about that. I expect to see a lot of people here and to end the day. And with that, I'll let you go, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks again. Bye-bye.